Hi, my name is Sarah Wilcott, and I'm a technician at the University of Manitoba, and I work specifically on the long-term studies, long-term agronomic studies that we have here. Uh, so that mainly entails uh, working with a lot of data, as well as archiving material, as well as some field work that I get to do as well. The first study that I work on is the Glenlee long-term rotation, and we have previously, a couple weeks ago, done a video about that. So you can check out our YouTube channel um, to see that field tour this summer. Um, the other study that I work on is called the Pesticide Free Production. So that was started about 20 years ago to look at how omitting in-crop pesticides occasionally would impact the um, weed populations. And that study has been uh, changed in 2017 and it now focuses on uh, seeding density and row spacing to reduce the weed, the weed seed bank. Another study is the Nickel Field Lab. So that's the National Center for Livestock and the Environment. And that study started in 2007, looking at how different types of manure, um, how the, the nitrogen and phosphorus are available from those different types of manure in annual and perennial cropping systems. That was changed in 2015 and the manure applications were stopped. And then the study focused on how the nitrogen becomes available and the, how the phosphorus gets drawn down. Um, in those cropping systems. So the current um, focus of that study is now the perennial system has been put back into annual cropping and the different management techniques are going to be used to see how or if you can maintain that soil health that's built up during the perennial um, system. So the next one is the next generation no-till which I am standing in front of right now so we'll go more into detail about that study coming up but it's a collaboration with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and this is one of seven sites across Canada and the goal is to uh, optimize a cropping system for each ecozone so looking at different rotations and see which one could be the best for uh, each region. And then the last one is a cover crops study so that project has sites in Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta looking at the reliability of uh, growing cover crops across these regions as well as the impacts on yield of growing cover crops with or without or in a crop with or without cover crops as well as the overall benefits and drawbacks of using cover crops including economic agronomic and environmental so if you're interested in any information any more information about these studies i'll have my information below and you can contact me and i'll also link some more information that you could look at I'm here with Catherine Stanley, who's the research associate working on this project. So Catherine, what is this study all about? Thanks, Sarah. So this study is optimizing systems productivity, resilience, and sustainability in prairie ecosystems. Um, as you mentioned earlier, we have the Carmen location behind us. There are six other prairie locations across Saskatchewan and Alberta as well. Um, in this experiment, we have seven different crop rotations that all are different based on the crops which are contained in the rotations, but also how the nutrients are managed. So the systems vary from a range of business as usual, uh, just looking at soil test reports for fertilizer requirements all the way to systems that are diversified with green manures and cover crops to provide diverse nitrogen supplies. So in this no-till crop ro rotation study we have a whole diversity of different crop types that we're growing. Um, we have a diversity of grain crops, we're also growing uh, more forage type crops for cover crops and green manures and we also have some perennial crops. So for the annual grain crops we're growing spring wheat canola, uh, winter wheat, fall rye, grain corn, we're growing dry pinto beans, soybeans, and sunflowers as you can see behind me. And then for some diverse cropping systems we have, uh, we are doing some intercrops. To my right we have a field pea and canola intercrop. And we're also growing a corn and soybean intercrop, which will be harvested for grain. In our legume-based rotations, we have um, a green manure, which consists of faba beans, crimson clover, and barley. And in that same crop rotation system, after fall rye, we follow with a cover crop that consists of field pea, faba bean, and oat. 
And then unique to the Manitoba site, we're growing perennial grains, Kernza, um, which we have two different plots this year. One crop that it's in, will be harvested its second year uh, this fall, and the other which will be harvested um, for the first time this fall. And we'll also be establishing a new crop for the first seeding date. Okay, uh, my name is Martin Entz, and uh, I'm the uh, principal investigator here with uh, Catherine Stanley, who is the research associate working on this study. And uh, my hat says natural systems agriculture. And that's really the focus of the lab that I lead. And what Catherine has done here is incorporated different sort of natural systems agriculture features into this no-till rotation. And uh, so Catherine, tell us a little bit about the plot that we're standing in and uh, how you manage it. Sure, thanks Martin. Um, so this plot is a fall rye plot that we recently harvested last week. In the year prior to this, we had a green manure crop. So a green manure crop is a crop that's legume based. We grew it for an entire season with the sole purpose of providing nitrogen for the fall rye crop. So uh, last year in 2019, um, after the termination of the green manure crop, we seeded the fall rye crop last fall. We've since harvested it and in a couple of weeks we'll come in and we'll actually be seeding a legume based cover crop. Um, in this particular field we'll be planting a faba bean a forage pea variety, so a 4010 forage pea, and then we'll also be companion cropping that with an oat or a barley. That crop will be grown hopefully ideally here in the next couple of weeks while we still have good sunlight and good growing conditions. It has been quite dry so optimally we hope to have some good moisture. Uh, what we did last year is we let that crop grow until freeze up and then in the in the spring we direct seeded uh, directly into that crop. And my last question about this rotation uh, with rye is, uh, or my last two questions, is what is the whole rotation sequence here? Mm -hmm. And then the question that everybody wants to know is like, how did it do this year? Uh, what variety did you plant and, and uh, what, would, what was the yield? Uh, what, what, how do you think it yielded? Sure, we just took it off last week, so I don't know the exact yield, but we uh, actually planted a hybrid fall rye variety here. We used Bono fall rye um, and based on the size of the plot we took off, it looked like it yielded very well. Um, so in this entire crop rotation sequence, I did mention we planted a green manure last year. We have a fall rye with a cover crop um, in this year. Next season, we'll follow that up with a corn and soybean intercrop. And after that, we'll follow that with a canola pea intercrop. Okay, so wait a minute. What you're saying is that it's intercrops all the time here. Correct. Okay, so... A highly diverse rotation. The, okay, so this is a highly diverse rotation. Wow. So like that's that's like 10 different crop species growing over four years yes correct about that are you going to show us <laughs> okay yeah that's right and i love the variety name bono because you too is my favorite band <laughs> um so uh are we going to have a chance to see the other intercrops yes yes we will okay yeah Okay, so that's it for the rye plot. We're going to now go see the other intercrops in this rotation. Okay, so in the last uh, uh, part of this rotation, Catherine, you talked about all the intercrops and, you know, back to my hat, natural systems agriculture, uh, we know that diversity is important in nature or it happens in nature. Mm -hmm. So uh, you've got more diversity here. Tell us a little bit about this system. Um, so this system, as we mentioned before, follows the fall rye and the cover crop. And this is a corn and soybean intercrop, which are both Roundup Ready varieties that we'll be harvesting for grain. Okay, how did you, like, how is it possible to plant these two crops so accurately in individual rows? We used a corn planter. So we have a corn planter that has um, discs that allow for accurate spacing, and we just planted at the same time alternate rows of soybeans and corn. Okay. Great. And uh, how do you manage fertilizer in this particular system? In this particular system, um, we plant or we fertilize with potassium, phosphorus, and sulfur, but we have no nitrogen applied to this system. Okay. V very interesting. Um, now, what, what type of questions do people ask you when they come to this rotation and you're suggesting that um, they're possibly going to harvest both of these crops for grain? The biggest questions you 
hit the nail right on the head is how do you harvest this crop? Uh, how do we seed it, which we just covered, and how do you manage weeds? So because we are uh, seeding both a Roundup Ready cr crop here, we can spray the plots with glyphosate. At harvest time, however, that can pose a bit more of a challenge. Some farmers that we've spoken to are using these crops for silage mm -hmm. um, and or grazing them, but we will be harvesting both for grain. I don't really know how that'll work yet. <laughs> okay. okay, so so it looks like we need some farmer innovation and some engineers uh, to maybe redesign equipment, which is always possible. You know, it's quite interesting to me because in China, um, this is very common. Um, I've seen a lot of this uh, intercropping in China. There, it's harvested with either very small machines or by hand. Um, but uh, I think the incentive is... Uh, probably to increase total yield, right? Correct. Okay. Okay, so this is a corn soybean intercropping. Uh, so what about doing this under organic production? Uh, what Would you see this as a possibility in organic? Uh, and what might you need to do differently? Sure, I think as far as nutrient management, you can see that there's no nitrogen fertilizer applied here and okay. things are growing quite nicely. So as far as fertility, this is a really excellent possibility in an organic system. The one thing that you would have to keep in mind is how you're managing your weeds. So making sure either that you've done some mechanical weed control prior to seeding or that you are spacing your crops out wide enough to allow for some inter-row cultivation. Okay, so perhaps in an organic system, maybe you wouldn't grow soybeans, you'd grow a short season legume that you'd plant later after you've done an inter-row tillage. Correct. Um, so, so those are some of the possibilities. So, okay, so we've got the corn beans, uh, soybean uh, intercrop, uh, part of this rotation. The previous crop was the fall rye. With the cover crop. With a cover crop. What's next? What's next is pea and canola as an intercrop. Can we go look at that? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, so you've taken me to this next crop in the rotation. Tell us a little bit about what we're looking at. So what we're looking at here is a pea canola intercrop, mm -hmm. um, perhaps more fondly known as peola in Manitoba. It is something that is a little more uh, tried and tested within the prairie provinces. Okay. Uh, and yeah, we have field, or a field pea, a yellow pea variety growing at the same time as canola. Okay, and uh, how did you plant this intercrop? Sure, we planted this intercrop um, with a no-till drill with both plants at the same, or both seeds planted at the same time. Uh, we were able to put uh, the canola at a little bit of a shallower depth than the peas, which really helped with the emergence and germination of both crops. Okay, I guess that's one of the considerations, right? Because which of these crops should be planted a bit deeper than the other? Peas should be planted a bit deeper to ensure that they have adequate moisture for germination. Okay, okay. so uh, what do you think of this crop? Uh, how did it work out this year? This year we saw poor emergence overall of the canola and oh. that was kind of across the board even in our plots where we had uh, monocropped canola. But the peas have done really well and the peas have filled in really nicely in areas where the, where the canola didn't emerge. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess my last question is when farmers look at the kind of diverse rotation that we've introduced here, bringing the natural systems agriculture um, features through diversity, uh, I guess what about what do you think will happen in terms of the economics? And I, my question is, um, you know, is the inter is the diversity going to result in higher yields? But what about the cost of separating the grain or even the logistics of that? Do you have any thoughts on those questions? You know, I think it really depends on the year. Um, as far as profitability, and, and as we mentioned before, this system and the crop, crop rotations we're designing are also for resilience. So having an intercrop where you have two different crop species growing, they are, have shown to have the potential for overyielding, which can benefit your economics. But also, as I mentioned, you have something growing in every niche space. As far as separating and cleaning, that's always a cost to consider, as well as other harvest impediments like uh, moisture, storage. Um, but I think as far as Piola goes, it's something that's being tested extensively across the prairies, and there's a lot of experience and expertise with farmers, not only just on research stations. Okay, so um, our, that was my, my last thought is, uh, are farmers doing these three things? Are they growing fall rye? Are they growing corn and soybean? And are they growing canola and peas together? Um, I would say that the, or the corn and soybean would be more of a novel 
uh, crop rotation specifically because we are taking it for grain. I've heard from another a, a number of growers and, and farmers that are harvesting the corn but then they're just grazing after that so that's another addition of diversity into those crops cropping systems. Piola is has become more common especially in Saskatchewan and I think that we have seen reduced acres of fall rye across the prairies, but you do see farmers do have a lot of experience growing fall rye in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. That's right. I mean, just driving to the Carmen Research Centre today, I saw a sign for uh, fall rye seed sales. And that's something that you never saw a few years ago. Is that because of the new hybrid varieties? That can definitely be a part of it. The hybrid varieties um, have greater resistance to ergot and other diseases and have greater yield potential than traditional fall rye varieties. Okay, so thank you very much. So that was a rotation that in can includes a three-year uh, three crop rotation, four-year four crop rotation with a cover crop, and then fall rye with another cover crop, and then corn, and then now canola pea. So let's go look at some other features and see what Catherine has to say about those. Keeping in the theme of natural systems agriculture, uh, Catherine, uh, we know that perennials are really an important part of it. So tell me, uh, tell me what is behind us because it looks like a perennial to me. Yes, so behind us we have the perennial uh, grain crop Kernza. So this is a perennial wheat crop. Uh, this is in its second year. So by that I mean we will, this will be the second time we've harvested this crop this fall. Okay, so it was seeded two years ago and then it survived the winter and then last year you took a grain harvest and then it survived the winter again and now you're going to take another grain harvest? Yes, yeah, correct. And how long do you think you can sustain this production? Um, our goal uh, and a lot of the research shows that optimal yields can be achieved for three harvested years but we are going to try probably for a fourth year to extend the length of the crop rotations to match the other annual rotations. Okay, um, how do you harvest it? Uh, there's two ways of harvesting it. We can swath it and then let it dry down and come in with a, a combine but we've been straight cutting this. We straight cut it last year just quite high and then you flail mow the straw that's quite green behind. Okay, so you, you use a basic combine harvester, Correct. standard machine, okay. Um, I see there's a lot of green in there, so you said you flail mowed it as part of this experiment. Uh, what other co uses could the material after harvest provide? The material after harvest could also be uh, cut and baled off for livestock feed, or it could also be grazed. So if you're bringing animals into the system, it's a great opportunity to do some fall grazing and you'll still be able to get grain produced in the year following if you're managing your grazing properly. Okay, um, and we also know from other work here on the station that when we, when we graze a high carbon source like the straw of this, we actually increase its nutrient available for the following year. So that leads me to my question, how are you presently adding fer fertility to this system? In this system, uh, we don't have livestock or cattle or sheep involved, but we are still managing our fertility. Particularly after harvest and after we flail mow, we do come in with a broadcast application of nitrogen on this crop in the fall to stimulate regrowth and survivability over the winter into the following year, which is really important. Okay, so we're not eliminating fertilizer, but we are eliminating um, because it's a perennial, I guess my other thought is, are you eliminating pesticides compared to these other no-till systems here which would require uh, at least a spring burn-off uh, herbicide? We do use one uh, herbicide application mostly to target uh, winter annuals and perennial weeds that come up in the, we do that in the fall. We can't spray herbicides in the spring in this crop as you can compromise your yield potential. So there has been no spring application in this calendar year of herbicides on this particular crop. And we've sprayed no insecticides or fungicides either. Okay, um, so thank you very much. So this is Kernza, this is what we now call perennial wheat. And, um, and when will it be harvested? Uh, this probably would be harvested in the next couple weeks, I would imagine. Okay, thank you very much. This is an interesting looking plot, beautiful purple flowers. Uh, tell us what's going on here, Catherine. So these plots, we had some extra space in this, this experiment to play around and we're actually incorporating an organic crop rotation within this system. So last year we planted millet here and this year we have a hairy vetch and barley green manure, um, which will be uh, go into an organic cropping system next year. 
Okay, so where's the barley? I see this is a presumably hairy vetch here. Um, and so how was it planted and what happened to the barley? Because I don't see any barley. So when we planted this, we did use just a zero-till disc drill. We had no um, cultivation or we didn't work this piece before. Um, but what we do in a hairy vetch and barley system, which was developed here in the Natural Systems Agriculture Lab, is we roller crimp the barley right at flowering time. And the crimp actually terminates the barley and will not allow it to produce seed. Whereas the vetch continues to grow, as you can see, um, quite, uh, quite tall and, and quite robustly throughout the rest of the growing season. And we'll leave it right here until it freezes, where it will provide a mulch for next year. Okay, so you're saying this will winter kill uh, and then form this mulch. And what are you going to plant here in this organic system next year? And how are you going to seed it? So the, the goal is for next year to be a zero-till organic system, uh, but really that will depend on the amount of growth we continue to get in the vetch throughout the growing season. So you have to assess the amount of dry material on um, the ground prior to freeze up or in the spring, but we will come in with a zero-till disc drill and plant either flax or wheat. Okay, so there is a possibility that you will zero till into here. Yeah. And so for viewers, uh, we do have on our Natural Systems Agriculture website uh, a, a video of almost 10 years ago now where Keith Bamford was actually zero tilling flax into a mulch like this mm -hmm. and it worked really quite well. We've, uh, you know, true to the words on my hat, we have looked at a number of Natural Systems Agriculture uh, fa features in this rotation. Uh, the ones that, that I remember from our little tour here is we had fall seeded crops instead of, so we had some seeding diversity. We had cover crops, we had green manures, we had intercrops, we had perennial crops in the Kernza. We've got uh, this crop, which is looks pretty amazing, which is, I guess we'd call it a green manure cover crop. What are you comparing these two? What are, you know, the sort of the rotations that are the benchmark that you're starting with? No, that's a good point. So we're comparing uh, these more diverse crops to uh, crop rotations traditional on the prairies that involve canola, soybeans, and spring wheat. I also see you have corn in the rotation, um, and uh, I just wonder if the, any of the other locations, uh, the other six locations across the prairies also have corn. Uh, nope, we are the only uh, system that being studied that has corn in the rotation. Okay, and that's probably because this is a long season growing area where corn is not unusual to see? Correct, yeah. Okay, so the final question I have is what are you measuring here? Like what, like, uh, what, what measurements are being taken and, and what are you going to do with that data? So we have two kind of classifications of measurements that we're taking here, some that are more longer term. So we've taken baseline measurements of uh, various soil health indicators before the trial started and we'll take them again um, in the fall after the final year of harvest. And then we have more annual measurements such as yield, we're looking at emergence, we're looking at weed data, uh, and as well as different diseases in, in each of these crop rotation systems. And so what about the, the thing that you know everybody's interested in is economics. Is that also part of the study? Yes, the Egg Canada team uh, will be doing economic analysis on the rotations. Um, we were talking earlier about how dry the seasons have been since you were here, uh, since you've had this experiment. And uh, tell us just a little bit about the weather patterns that you've had here in the last couple of years. Sure, so last year was very droughty throughout the whole growing season. This year we were lucky to have very good moisture at the very beginning of seeding time, but since then it's kind of followed a similar pattern to last year where we haven't seen a lot of rain since the beginning of July. Okay, so dry since the beginning of July. Uh, today is August 4th. Um, which of your crops seems to be struggling the most with drought and which seems to be handling it the best? Okay, so I'll start maybe the sunflowers since we're standing right beside them. You can see they're looking pretty good. Uh, they they're seem to be quite drought tolerant compared to something like corn. We can already see the lower leaves starting to dry off. Uh, we see uh, the spring wheat desiccating a little bit early and then we'll also see challenges with the pinto beans and soybeans with pod fill if we don't get some more moisture in the season. Okay, so sunflower is not only a happy crop, uh, is a beautiful happy crop, it is also um, what you're seeing is the leaves are remaining very turgid 
and um, and that that is uh, one of the things that we do know from our work here at Carmen that this is the deepest rooting grain crop that we have here. Um, the sunflower will easily go down to 180 centimeters at six feet uh, for its water, and um, so. Um, uh, this, I believe, is the only sunflower crop on the station? Yes, I believe so. <laughs> okay, that's right. So nobody else is really growing sunflower here right now. Um, uh, since we're talking about sunflower, it's another form of diversity. Uh, what have been the challenges growing this crop here? And uh, I know there's been some. And, and what, what have the provincial you know, oilseed specialists been advising on this crop uh, in terms of its management? One of the biggest challenges, and that's a really good question, has been weed management in this crop. So there, if you look into the canopy, there are quite a few weeds uh, growing within the sunflowers. We have used herbicides on this at least three or four times throughout the growing season, and there aren't really a lot of options for the different variety of weeds that we have growing here. So some of the things in speaking with the provincial specialists that are starting to be recommended are things that we work on a lot in the Natural Systems Agriculture Program is looking at um, factors such as cultural weed control, like uh, plant density and plant populations, as well as some mechanical weed control options um, to help with the weed management in a sunflower crop. Okay, it would be interesting to seed sunflower into that vetch that we have there. Yeah, uh, actually. Because, uh, yeah, so there's all kinds of options. So thank you very much. So that, um, that's the sunflower, which, uh, you know, it's been interesting because the bumblebees are working it and the crops, uh, of the crops that you work with, which ones tend to have the most beneficial insect activity? I think it's been really interesting because all the crops flower at different times in the season. So we've seen kind of the different insects migrate throughout the, the different crops, but I would say any of the intercrop, or specifically the pea canola intercrop that has a lot of different kinds of flowers, was very busy with mm -hmm. insect activity and now the sunflowers have been a real attractor for insects as you've seen when all the crops are not flowering anymore. So it's been a really good, it's a good August pollinator attractor. Okay, so that's an interesting observation. Having a diversity of crops in a farming system offers more season-long flowers for pollination. Yes, yeah, absolutely. It's an important part, I think. Okay, and what about the hairy vetch? Does it uh, have a lot of bumblebee activity? Yeah, the hairy vetch, especially right now that it's producing a lot of different flowers, uh, there's been a lot of different bees, a lot of insects working their way through that system as well. Can we go see some? Sure. Okay, I put Catherine on the spot here to see whether we'd have any bumblebees in the hairy vetch. Uh, do we have any bumblebees here right now? There are none here right now. <laughs> okay, but uh, do you ever see bumblebees in here? Yes, actually this morning I was out here earlier in the day and there was a lot of activity of bumblebees in this crop this morning. Okay, so I kind of put Catherine on the spot, but we know from previous work that the bumblebees love this crop and uh, they work it all the time. I'm, I'm quite surprised that there's none here right now. Maybe it's lunchtime, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, so, but, but it's, it's back to the same point that we were talking about earlier, that the diversity of plants actually give the, bi the insect biodiversity something to consume throughout the whole season. Okay, so thanks for joining us on our tour of, of this study and this rotation here. And thanks, Catherine, for putting up with all my crazy questions about what's going on here. And uh, um, it looks like you and your team have done a great work, great work here. I mean, the crops look beautiful. Uh, any final comments you'd like to make? Sure, yeah. I just wanted to say that I've really enjoyed, like, having experience with growing all these different crops that we have available to us in Manitoba. It's also been great to work with the team at Ag Canada, all the scientists across the prairies, and our, and our team here at Natural Systems Agriculture. It's a group effort to get a massive project like this uh, successfully underway. So thank you. Thanks very much. And so thanks for joining us. We'll see you again.